This is chapter 35, Continuation and Completion of Salvation. So I'm going to do, again, two lectures. I'm going to start with sanctification and do perseverance as a second one. Uh, okay, so sanctification. We're going to continue big theological terms, um, but the concepts behind them are super important, and that's the idea of sanctification. So we had back here in the predestination side before creation, we had God's plan being worked out. We had, in a believer's life, past tense. I've got uh, conversion, regeneration, justification, adoption. Present tense for a believer, which we're talking about now, is what we're calling sanctification, which is a setting apart and becoming like Christ. Then we're going to talk about future tense. We're going to talk about glorification and perseverance to that, but that will yet to come. So let's talk about sanctification. And the, the basic, basic, basic definition of sanctification is really pretty widely agreed to. Uh, but I want to talk about things that are common among... There's a lot of variation in here, but the, the commonality with everyone is we're justified by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, apart from all works. I don't have to do anything to merit being declared not guilty. Uh, then there's a difference between my position as child of God, accepted child of God, justified, and my condition. There's a lot of not-son stuff about me. I've put on the new self, Colossians 3.10, but I need to put on compassion and such. So there's a difference there between my sometimes called standing and state. So I'm child of God, but I don't act like a child a lot. Uh, there's an agreement that holiness, becoming like Christ, is the number one priority for all Christians. There's no antinomians, to use a fancy term. There's no people that think that moral conditions have nothing to do in a believer's life. Well, it's not quite true. There are those who believe it, but biblical Christians don't believe that. We all agree, we all agree that the Holy Spirit indwells a believer at conversion. Everybody believes that. Uh, we all agree that absolute perfection is absolutely not possible in this world. Uh, no matter how much you think of, you can go that direction, Nobody thinks we feel like Christ-like perfection in this world. Uh, we believe, on the other hand, that the Holy Spirit gives power for becoming like Christ, for holiness to all believers, and we should live that out. And there's a, well, a, a definite distinction between uh, the bentness of my desires as a believer and acting out those desires. So, you know, I have, I have, my thing is I have desires to pin stupid buttons on people. I just, it's, it's a gift of mine. You're really stupid. Let me show you how stupid you are. We call that sin. That desire is there, but the acting on that desire is a distinct thing. And everybody recognizes those differences and how that works out. So when you start playing with provisions of sanctification, and this is in Dr. Erickson's stuff, there's a, there's a Wesleyan view, an old line Western view that says through some sort of second work of gracious imp working in my life that I can be rid of my sinful desires and I can have nothing but love in me. Uh, there's a, a Keswick view that says I'm never going to get any better, but if I just let go and let God, the Holy Spirit will run my life and uh, and I will I'll live a a fully Christ-like life, but it'll be because the Holy Spirit is doing the work, not because I do it. Uh, there's a there's a group that would say, well, you know, I've got a whole bunch of demons in me, and I need to get rid of those demons, and when I get rid of the demons, then I'll, and there's lots of different views. And there's a group that says, you know, you're, you're just a miserable sinner, but just gut it out and obey God's moral law, and you'll become better. Just keep working hard. And there's some elements of truth of all of those, but what I want to speak to is a view that's pretty widely held and with variations is true for pretty much everybody. And Dr. Erickson unpacks this well. Uh, and that's the idea that we receive a new identity as child of God, and we receive that because of our union with Christ, because of our adoption. Uh, we get a new heart. That's the regeneration piece, the 
fundamental desire changes. We get a new indwelling Holy Spirit. That's a new empowerment. I get a new community of Jesus followers, and that all happens as a part of my conversion, all at that same time. And then what we do is we live out that reality by the, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. We become progressively more like Christ. So that would be just kind of a fundamental thing. And what I'm going to suggest to you, this is what we call a new covenant model of sanctification. Good spokesman, this is John Piper, uh, many others, Dallas Willard, uh, Dr. Erickson, many others, uh, is the idea that I have that new heart. Now, let me show you this in Scripture. Uh, look at Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. Uh, chapter 5 is talking about our justification. Chapter 6 is talking about our regeneration. And chapter 7 is talking about now, I think, justified, regenerated people. And like, what do we do with this thing? Are we still under the Mosaic law? He's staying here as, as uh, saved people. And in six verses, he says, no, we're released from the law. We're at least from the Mosaic Code. We're not under that anymore. I think we're still under the Abrahamic moral law, but the, we're not going to use the law of Moses as a solution for our sin. Why? Because it doesn't change my desires. The Verse 12, the law is holy. The command is holy, righteous, good. But it doesn't work for me. Sin puts me to death because the law just becomes a source of condemnation because it's not life-giving. But now, look at verse 14. This is Romans 7, 14. Have you got it there in front of you? Hmm. Look at Romans 7, 14 through 23, maybe, 24. What is it that Paul wants to do? Take a look at it. Romans 7, 14 through 23. What is it that Paul wants to do? Verse 16, if I do what I do not want, he's talking about sin there, because he hates it. Uh, in verse 19, or verse 18, I have the desire to do what's right. But I don't have the ability to carry it out. Verse 19, for I do not do the good I want, but the evil I don't want is what I keep doing. See, what he wants here is to be like Christ. I think that's regeneration at work. Now, if I do what I don't want, he says, it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Well, that's a complicated verse. This is verse 20. If I do what I do not want, how come? He says, not I, that's the regenerated self, that's the child of God, but it's sin that dwells in me. Uh, so he talks about sin dwelling in me. Verse 18, he talks about flesh. Those are those sinful desires. So part of my being as a person is this new heart that wants to do good things, but there's also this flesh, these sinful desires. And he, he makes it almost like it's not me, but it is me. And the frustrating thing is because of that ongoing reality of sin, sinful desires in me, I keep doing things I don't want to do. I keep pinning stupid buttons on people, as awful as that is. I don't want to do it, but I just do it. How come? Because there's stuff in me. What's the solution for that? Well, it's not to go back and put more commands on my life. Uh, in fact, what he talks about here in verse 24, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? But in verse chapter 8, he reminds us there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. The law of the spirit of life sets you free from the law of sin and death. What God had done, the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son, he condemned sin and the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be filled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. There's the key. 
We have flesh, sinful desires. We have spirit, new heart and dwelling Holy Spirit. And we can choose to live in the power of the Spirit, to live out my deep desires in my new heart, and from that I can live out that new identity. So another example of that, look at, uh, oh, where shall I go? How about Galatians chapter 5? Galatians 5.16. Uh, I say, walk by the Spirit and not gratify the desires of the flesh. So the desires of the flesh are against Spirit, Spirit against the flesh. Those are opposed to each other. It keeps you from doing the things you want to do. And I think the things you want to do are the godly things. And what he's saying, if I walk by the Spirit, then I will do the things I generally want to do. What's the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. So he's saying, and he goes on to say, if we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. So the power of sanctification, in one sense, sanctification is being dedicated to God. In another sense, the sanctification is the progress toward being like Christ. The way we pursue those good works, the way we pursue that new kind of life, is to come back to the power of the Spirit in us, live in the community of the Spirit around us, live out those new desires that are with us. So what do I do when I face temptation? What do I do when I want to pin a stupid button on a person? As a professor, I get a lot of opportunity to pin stupid buttons on people. It seems to me that what I do when I'm in a situation where I've got a decision, the first thing I do is I stop and think. What Satan says, just act, just do it, do what comes naturally. No, stop, think. Uh, pray. If I stop and think, and if I pray, and what I'm doing there is affirming my status as child of God, and I do it in community, a community of people who are also living graciously. If I stop and think, connect with God, affirm my identity as child of God, do it in community of people who are likewise committed and say, help, and then do what will make me most deeply happy. See, a new heart means that my deepest desires are godly desires, not my strongest desires necessarily, but my deepest desires. If I stop and think, pray in community of word and spirit, and do what will make me most deeply happy, then I'll almost always do the right thing. To me, that's kind of a pattern for sanctification, living the Christian life. There are others who say, no, I'm just, you're a, you're, nothing righteous in you, all your righteous is filthy rags and such. That's talking about unregenerate Jews. That's talking about sinful people who reject the word of God. For those who are new covenant Christians, my deep desires are godly. Stop and think, don't just act. Pray, child of God. Live in a community that's word and spirit, scripture and spirit in that community do what make most deeply happy, and when I put those together, I will increasingly do the right thing. I will increasingly see love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control as a characteristic in my life. One last verse, 2 Peter chapter 2, 2 Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1, huge, 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 powerful passage. Verse 3, 2 Peter 1, 3, his divine power, that's that power of the Holy Spirit, that regenerative power, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. There's the power. Verse 4, he is granted to us by his precious and very great promises. 
So we have these promises, that's the new covenant promises, the promise of Messiah. So that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature. That doesn't mean become gods, but we become part of that divine characteristics, the compassion, gracious, slow to anger, faithful, loving, forgiving, just God of Exodus 3, 4, 6, and 7. Having escaped the corruption that's in the world because of sinful desire, there's the flesh piece. And verse 5, for this very reason, make every effort to supplant your faith with virtue, with knowledge, self-control, steadfastness, godliness, brother, affection, love, and so on. These are qualities that are yours and are increasing. I think that's the picture of, self, of sanctification. Because I'm dedicated to God, I have this power, I have these promises, I become a partaker of the divine nature, and then because of that power that's in me, because of the community around me, I make every effort to live out my deepest desires, beginning with faith and ending with love, and these qualities are mine in increasing manner, so the sanctification is a progressive kind of thing, and my effort is a piece of that, but it's an effort that's spirit-empowered and love-enabled, gospel-based, not just my moralistic efforts, but my gospel-based efforts working, and that's where sanctification comes from. So, a lot to be said here, but gosh, what an important topic to understand what sanctification means, that incredible power that I get to become like Christ in the community.